that there was two sources of learning. learning, learning from the past, like you read the book and then you can recollect the book and so on. And then the possibility of learning from the future. So nowadays we have a lot of the attention deficit disorder that the origin was in a survival mechanism. But the ego can be actually our friend if we use it to become better ourselves. And Daji says that a lot, like, um, how can I become a better version of myself? Do you really want to meditate? And the heart is yelling like, no, 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 no. But just, oh no, this is really okay. The question is who are the most successful people? And I, I can ask you that question. Are the, the, do you think are the, the altruists? Are the, the takers or are the matchers? Anger, for instance, is a healthy response to put boundaries. Without the heartfulness practice, I would not. I was probably being smoking night, probably three packs a day or four. Maybe I already had a, a heart attack by this time. Woof woof. Welcome to KanaCast. Today I'm speaking to Vasco Gaspar. Vasco is an international author, speaker and facilitator. He organizes programs across the world that bring together science-based methodologies such as mindfulness, presencing, heartfulness, internal family systems, polyvagal theory, and compassionate inquiry. Recently, Vasco was in Kanha Shantiwanam where he organized a deep you retreat. We caught up with him on the sidelines. Vasco, you travel the world as uh, you're an author, you're a speaker, you hold coaching programs. You, uh, there's, there's so much that you do and you travel around the world. And you recently held this uh, very intense program in Kanha itself called the Deep You Retreat. Yes, yes, yes. Which was larger than most programs that you, you hold actually because there were a hundred people. So what was it that stood out for you in this? Uh, how did you manage this group of diverse people? Because usually you, you said you uh, manage about 20 to 25 people in a retreat. But here there were about 100. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to large groups when more in, the, in other settings like keynotes and so on. But, 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 it, but in the, the deep you, as you, as you were saying, the, it's like an intimate, um, let's call it sacred space that we try to, to create. And I was, I was a bit afraid to see oh, how is this going to work with 100 people. But the good thing is that I'm not the only one holding the space. So there was, so I was probably more visible because I was facilitating and people, I was kind of um, guiding the program. But there was, I would say, more than 150 volunteers from Kanha, preceptors, people from Kitchen, of course, the co-facilitators, Maria, Stan, um, and, and so many other volunteers, like the tour guides. Um, I don't know, so many names that I, I'm not going even to start saying names because the, then the, 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 the conversation was just saying <laughs> these different names. So, so in a sense, it was very easy um, because not only there was these volunteers, but there also was this... Um, um collective energy of the space that was holding the holding us holding us together so this and this makes the whole difference the, the beauty of the space the presence of the space the sacredness of the space the stillness of the space so and that makes my work really easy because uh, my work is okay i just say a few things and then put people together doing exercises and um and uh, and to have the possibility of, of of being held myself, also being held by so many people, makes my work really easy. And then it's really about creating a, con a, a safe container for people to know each other, know themselves, connect with nature. And uh, so my work in that sense is easy because it's more about creating a safe container. And it was really touching to see that um, yeah, it can be 100, but but uh, it's not about the size. It's about the depth of the container. And with a large group of people, like in, in a magical place like this, and with divine guidance present, it's 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 kind of easy. And and actually, in 2018, I had the opportunity also to be here for the youth seminar. And in that case, it was 1,000 people. So I was just having like 
few conversations like few sessions like one hour session uh, two hours two times a day one hour session a long i don't know five days or so and the uh, the quality and the depth of the space was also there and and again i, I think most of the uh, the secret the source let's call it like that is the invisible it's not the visible part the visible part is the easy part like if speaking about the container the contents or whatever but the container itself the invisible that people feel that your nervous system feels when it enters the room that is the most tricky part to hold and i was concerned with uh, there was such a diversity of people in this program people in their 20s people in their 80s people that are meditating for i don't know 50 years to people that was the first time meditating people from different religion backgrounds like um uh, from muslims to christians to i don't know so i was a bit um anxious let's let's put it like that i had an anxious part to see how how is it going to flow and this was a prototype uh, and i was open with people that this is going to be a prototype but again the, the way that the container was was holding us all this kind of um yeah, it was beautiful it was really beautiful so i feel sometimes i say that i probably did many good deeds in past lives to be blessed with all these uh, possibilities in this life so i don't know what i did but uh, probably it was something nice because i've been so blessed with so many beautiful people um so yeah only gratitude is in my heart at this moment yeah no and we spoke to some of the people who attended the program and they loved it and they really enjoyed it so obviously. we pay good money to them to say the <laughs> posted their checks already yeah yeah already <laughs> <laughs> so it was no but everyone received it so well and they were so happy and you keep saying that i do very little but uh, i'm sure there's a lot of work that goes on um, i'm just being a channel for something so it's easy in that sense yeah <laughs> But you mentioned there is also that level of anxiety that comes when something new, you're doing something new, you're doing unexpected. And a lot of us face that when we, in different situations, anxiety is there. And sometimes what can happen is that anxiety you can translate into the atmosphere and everybody kind of picks it up. And that kind of, uh, how, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid that in a setting like this where, where the atmosphere is very important? So there's many things. So about my own anxiety, the way I, I need to do my own work, homework. Okay. So uh, of course I've I've been doing this for 15 years. So there's of course there's anxieties. I, I imagine it's a little bit like being a musician before entering the stage. There's always this stage anxiety, and I think that's good because it put us present and not thinking, oh, I'm the best one. I'm going to play whatever. So I think anxiety in this case is very very good to put us in like checking ourselves. And of course, the way I do it is is through my own practices, the way I meditate, the way I do my cleaning, the way I, if I have sittings or not, if, if I slept well or not, the, the food I eat. So all these things, it's very important for me as a facilitator, because for instance, if I don't sleep well, I'm not going to be so sharp to be able to, I don't know, tell a story or to make a connection. Um, if, for instance, while people are arriving in the room, even now, before we starting this conversation, I, I was doing a little cleaning and praying for me just to be a channel for something to flow through me and basically stepping out of my own way because if I'm staying here trying to say something wise or intelligent it's not going to work so it's kind of a paradox I need to go out of my own way and to be able to be a vessel for something and that take, that takes work it takes a lot of mistakes I've been doing so many mistakes in this past 15 years with with people um, trainings and keynotes and so on sometimes I finish a keynote and I just want to hide in the in the hole <laughs> like and cry but that brings also some humility in in a, in a sense that okay uh, what did went wrong what can i how can i do it better and and again in in the container to um to really try to to it's difficult to put into words but there's so many things that we can work on the setting things from the sound that is playing the way the chairs are, are the beauty of the space the um, even for instance in portugal the dpu original program is three days we have a scent that there was a there was a, a, a i don't know how to call him like a designer of of smells of scents he's a professional person that worked with aromatherapy and he designed a specific scent for each day which has an intention so working very much with intention so the dpu 
you a little a little bit like in Heartfalls, there's the intention, Sankalpa, working very much with Sankalpa for this to be a program that benefit the greater good, that can benefit people, their their higher self, the manifestation of who they are in this world, and for that manifestation to be of service of a greater good. And then it's surrendering to whatever comes into the field. Uh, I don't speak so much about this to people, and, and I'm opening this um, online <laughs> for it to be available. But most of the work is, is, is on that invisible side. So, of course, the visible, I've, I've been trained in these different technologies and practices in the in last years. And of course, that, that requires effort and time and dedication. But most of all is about working on the subtle level and, uh, and praying, praying for, <laughs> I hope we survive. <laughs> And you've done these programs with people from all parts of the world, all cultural backgrounds. And um, an, uh, uh, an important component of these programs is music and poetry. Uh, how does it work with uh, different cultures? Does it cross the barriers easily? I feel so. And one, one of the things I always suggest, because we are all, all, all different, right? And I might be putting a music uh, that might be very touching for me and opens my heart. And it might bring a sad memory to someone and like touch a deep, I don't know, pain inside. So, but one of the things uh, we always try to bring into the field is for them, imagine a poem or a music or an exercise or a, a sharing that everything to approach everything as an experience. And you just try it out if you feel safe. So the importance of safety in the container for me is what is most important is for to have a safe container. And if they feel safe enough to try it out or listen to a music or just lie down for five minutes, like taking a rest as we do after lunch, try it out. And if it's helpful and useful, you take it with you. If it's not, just leave it. So, but have an attitude of a, uh, like a scientist uh, or or someone that is curious to experience experience something, and 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 you are the expert. So we are just creating creating a installation like an art installation, and you just go through this installation. It's like, almost like a. Uh, in, sometimes I say that in before the program we go into this like journey, and we're going to have um, almost fifty or sixty stops trying many different things and and some people will touch you and, and some things will uh, probably upset you so and you and, and you are we trust that you are profoundly wise profoundly sane profoundly capable to discern if this is going to be useful or not and if yes you're going to take it with you if not you're going to leave it and if you don't even want to try it out the only requirement is that if you don't want to do it you just don't do it but allow others to do it that's all you don't you, you don't want to do something that's really you don't want to meditate perfect okay you must have a good reason not to do it and you don't need to ex even explain to me give an excuse whatever you don't want to i don't know do something strange with your body moving your body which for some people especially for instance in this culture we invite people to do in go into these social presencing theater exercises which involve moving the body and touching each other of course with a lot of respect and it has a purpose, uh, but some people don't feel comfortable, so they they just don't do it. And they they have other possibilities. While we are doing this, they can go outside, and they can be doing a dialogue, a deep dialogue. So the idea is to have different entry points for people: the body, the mind, the heart, uh, the dialogues, the connection with nature. And I believe that if we offer a safe container for people to try these different things, they can. I believe that at least there's something that will touch your heart, that will put a little tiny seed that allowed you, uh, will allow you to remind yourself of who you really are, that you are much bigger than you think you are, and at the same time, much more insignificant than you think you are. So it's kind of the both. Paradox. Yeah, this paradox of that you really, if you really dissolve yourself and be of service to life, it's really about the what is life wanting to live through me? You know, can, can I be a dancer, um, actually a dance for life to dance me and to surrender to life? And if I'm able to do that and step out of my own way, my little, if my little ego that wants to achieve something or to be seen or to be loved, we all, we all want to be seen and loved and feel competent and so on. We all have these needs. But at the same time, if we 
allow ourselves to be open and to be touched and to recognize the insane, insane, uh, innate basic uh, sanity that's inside, uh, we are able to manifest it in the world. And we, it can be manifested as a shoemaker. If I'm a shoemaker, how can I be of service to make the most beautiful shoes? If I'm a, a media artist, how can I allow myself to be of service of my art? If I'm a business person, how can I allow my business to maybe serve a greater good? So, so we believe, this is our belief, maybe we are just being naive, that we all have this innate basic goodness inside. And if people connect with that sanity inside, and you connect with the sanity with each other and connect with the sanity of this larger being you can call this you can call it god you can call it life you can call it master life will be easy for everyone doesn't mean that there's no challenges of course <laughs> there's a lot always but the challenges will be probably faced also with a different perspective that oh maybe this challenge is coming for me to break a little barrier of my ego or for me to learn something new and and um so yeah, so I don't know if I'm answering your question or if I'm just rambling around, so yeah. No, but it's interesting that you mentioned the ego and uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, the paradox that you said you are the most uh, amazing thing and completely insignificant. You're the most significant thing, you're the universe and also you're the most insignificant thing in the universe. So the ego sometimes can put us in places of, we get hurt, we get uh, angry, we react. Why is this person not listening to me? Can't he understand me? And yeah, I'm not important. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I to I told you so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a famous. I told you so. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they just don't get it. So, is that something through practice? Does it? Does it? Can we regulate it to an extent that we can perform better? Have you personally? How have you found it? Is it? Is it easy to get over that? Because a lot of us live in that place and our reality is pretty much that, that, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm living there also. So <laughs> that ego trip. <laughs> I think so. And, and um, not think, I believe so. And uh, I believe there's many entry points that we can uh, help the ego to dissolve. Uh, and of course, one for me that is very dear is, of course, heartfulness. So through cleaning, through having sittings, through... Uh, if I look at my life 15 years ago, I was smoking 40 cigarettes a day. I had 20 kilograms more. I was uh, an, a workaholic. Uh, I'm still a, yeah, I'm a bit a workaholic, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, I was drinking a lot of alcohol to relax and to... Ba basically, I was trying to find ways to regulate myself and not to touch the pain inside. And basically, the ego was just trying to protect that pain. So these layers of the ego, basically, they are... I believe they are coming... They are... In, in here many times to protect the the wounds that, that we I don't know imagine my father didn't saw me when I was a child because I was the youngest brother and or he was stressed out whatever so we all have these stories or I was abused as, as a as a as a young person or in in school people laughed at me or whatever so we all have these stories so and and not to touch those wounds of I'm not important. I'm not competent, I'm, I'm not good enough. So we all have these burdens and these exiled parts that we don't want to touch. So, and then we create these covers to not touch these wounds. What these covers don't know, these, let's call it parts of us, like these sub-personalities don't know, is that we are not that age anymore. Almost like they, they were useful and helpful. For instance, imagine a child. If you are two, three, imagine you are a baby, even, even like you cannot even speak. So you have needs, you, you cry. Imagine you cry at night. And when you're crying, uh, imagine that your parents don't pick you up, which is very common. Actually, many medical doctors say, don't pick your uh, son. So what is the message that the child receives if, if he or she is crying in the middle of the night uh, in stress, in pain, maybe feeling pain. If the person that is supposed to take care of him or her is not picking him or her, there's an implicit memory that I'm not important. My needs are not important. And to deal with that pain, we need to develop sometimes a, a way to not feel the pain. And sometimes a, a easy way to do it is to 
dis- disconnect, to dissociate. And many parents do this to the kids, not because they are bad parents. Many times they are doing this because the medical doctor said you should do yeah. this to the for for him or her to learn that it, there's times to sleep and so on. Uh, a baby cat doesn't do that. A mother cat doesn't do that to to to, to the baby cat. Um, uh, a mother dog doesn't do that to the to the dog. Uh, um, so. So we developed these strategies to deal with pain, like for instance, dissociating. If if the pain is too much, for instance, the baby, if the pain is too much, the baby might dissociate. Or if there's a lot of stress in the house, everyone is screaming, the baby dissociates. So why does he or she dissociates? Because it's too painful. And then the what was useful to deal with pain as a coping mechanism as the 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 child grows up it develops maybe as a problem like hdhd so attention deficit disorder so nowadays we have a lot of the attention deficit disorder that the origin was in a survival mechanism was to distract ourselves because it was too painful so why am i saying this because we develop these layers of ego many times to protect the pain but the good news is that we there's possibilities and through, again, cleaning, through sittings, through therapy. And I would not say every type of therapy, but some specific types of therapy that are trauma-based, such as internal family systems, IFS, such as compassionate inquiry, such as um, somatic experiencing, they go to the root of the trauma and they allow the, let's call it samskara, to be released. So they are not spiritual practices, but they can help release some of these samskaras, some of this pain to be released and for us to integrate um, ourselves. So coming back to your question, I feel the more we are able to release these burdens inside, the more we can still notice that, oh, I have this part of me that is a perfectionist or is a part of me that is a striver, this part of me that is a joker. And I can still have these parts and they can be very useful and helpful when they are useful and helpful. But when they are not, I can ask them to step back. Um, I can ask them to uh, imagine if I'm standing in front of a group of people speaking and there's a part in me that I notice that is kind of coming and want to be seen and be important and to say, I don't know, um, like wise things. And I notice this part sometimes coming here in this conversation. And most of my work is to be aware and to say, can you please step? step Yeah, just step back. And, I, and to say thank you, thank you, you're trying to help me. You're trying to, for me to be good in this conversation and to show to the camera well, whatever. Thank you, but you're not needed now. Just stay there in the back and I like you, thank you so much. You, you're very helpful and useful in many, many times and especially in the past. But now in this moment, just trust, just surrender, let go, go with the flow. So most of the work, at least as, as a human being and going through life, of dealing with the ego, the ego construction. In the last three years, for instance, I've been doing so many, so much therapy on myself. So I, I, I did it because I was going through this this program to become a certified therapist in compassionate inquiry in, in internal family system. So I needed to go through it. So in the last three years, I had more than, I don't know, 100 therapy sessions myself. And I noticed that many layers of my ego were dissolved so i still have a lot of a lot of work to do uh but but uh but with each tear that comes uh there's a little m- more dissolution and, yeah. and 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 transparency and then and then it comes up again even yesterday i was in canteen there was and i was having this part of me that wanted food and there was confusion and i was becoming angry and so on and with myself and then my wife of course the wife so was bringing us to the present moment she just brought me back to reality and i connected and i okay and i just came back and i Mm-hmm. had a dialogue with his my inner subpersonalities, the inner parts, and then I was able to yeah. center again. But I think it's a continuous journey and continuous sure. movement, and many times a laborious one and, um, and not an easy one. And also uh, people tend to judge themselves for faults that they have, like, you know, uh, when they when they give in to, when they react. Uh, yeah, the inner critic is one of the main main ones. Yes, uh, after the reaction is over, then they, then they have this low self-worth that... Uh, yeah, why did you 
always say that I'm just a terrible person. I and, that, and that is a learning coping mechanism because it was very helpful at some point, especially if you have, for instance, if you had people that were very critical of you when you were growing up, like a parent or a teacher, we develop these parts, like an inner critic part, for a good reason. Because if yes. I criticize myself first, I make sure that the others will not criticize me after. So it's good. It's good that we have this part that is like, trying to put us on track but the problem is when these parts are crystallized and they become part of the personality and you cannot imagine Rudy the, uh, the amount of people during the DPU program not only here but every time they come to me with this this uh, pain of um, actually there was a woman I think I told you the other day that came to, to me after the, the program and she said I'm 60 something years old I attended many seminars in my life and this was the first time the first seminar I allowed myself to be fully me without without so that for me was a a, a sign of safety that she was feeling safe with 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 herself first safe with others and she was accepting her that she was not perfect she had this part she has the inner critic she has we all have these parts and uh, and the beautiful thing is that these parts are always trying to help us they always have a good reason uh, we tend to to see ego as the bad guy yeah. but the ego can be actually our friend if we use it to become better ourselves and that she says that a lot like um how can I become a better version of myself? And if we allow the ego to drop the burdens, the pains that we are holding, that again, it was helpful and useful to hold them when we were a child. Because even, for instance, a child doesn't have the capacity to self-regulate by themselves. So he needs an adult to regulate. So if again, if you're crying, there's no adult for some reason, you need to stuff that inside. So, but then the thing is that we forget about it and it's there. So, and... But as we release those things, we are more able to be connected with, again, our self with a capital S or divine light, if you want to call that, use that term, with our, that innate basic goodness and sadness, sad, uh, sadness as well sometimes, but, um, but that innate basic sanity and goodness inside. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned sadness, or it just came up, because actually for some, there is a kind of sadness to uh, you know and it's it's kind of almost a sweet melancholy in a way you know it's kind of a it's kind of a remembrance but not really of what you don't know you don't know what you're remembering but you're nostalgic about something it's something like that so that is a very valid experience that people have very often you know not everybody experiences just the innate goodness all the time there is that sadness but it's tinged with i suppose a little uh, you know, memory or something. Yeah, yeah. And also, I had a teacher, I have it, and, and I still have, called Arawan Ayashi. She's from the Presencing Institute. And she normally used this term, um, sad, joyful heart. This this tenderness that even sometimes when, for instance, during the DPO program, I cried myself the whole time every time i saw an act of beauty every time i saw some some music some video it touched my heart and there was sadness associated there was beauty and sadness together and and it's so amazing that we when we touch that um layer yeah. inside it's i don't know how to put it into words but that yeah some music manages to do it also sometimes you know where music is beautiful and extremely sad me, Olafur Arnalds is a, is one of the authors that, that that brings me that connection. Who's the author again? Or Olafur Arnalds is an Icelandic uh, musician. Actually, in DPU, we use many musics of Olafur uh, because it brings that quality, that melancholy, that and and, and opens the heart. It really, wow. the heart starts at least to some people. Of course, maybe some will not, but for many people, it creates some. Opening. Actually, we start the program with one music from him called uh, "This Place Is a Shelter." So and that's the that's the intent. People don't know the name of the music, but the intention of the music is this: "This Place Is a Shelter." And it's such a beautiful, inspiring, beautiful, sad music. <laughs> yeah, for me, the Armenian duduk, you know, the flute that uh, it, ha it it's the duduk flute has this really. Uh, sound that seems to come deep sound and uh, melancholic and but extremely beautiful so it's uh, it's an interesting uh, state that 
sadness, happiness. And uh, how did you get involved with presencing, with uh, mindfulness, with all these different, and then of course heartfulness? How did, was it something that you said you were a workaholic? So you were in a corporate job, or what was your background? Yes. Yeah, so I was. I was. Um, let me get back. So in 1997, I, I, I read a book called uh, Celestine Prophecy. Or I think that's the name. And open something inside, so a possibility of something. But then I didn't have a teacher. I was a student in university. I didn't have a teacher or a guide to guide me. So I, then I just got back again to my uh, unhealthy uh, way of living. Then I studied as a psychologist. I, I became an organizational psychologist. I was working as a consultant, HR consultant, and then a process consultant in a company. And I was working a lot, smoking a lot, and so on. And then I read another book called A, N a New Earth from Eckhart Tolle. And that book opened again a longing to, to find something that I didn't know, almost like a memory of something that I, I knew it was possible, but I didn't know what it was. So that embarked me on a search, a quest, and I started reading a lot of books on happiness, well-being, spirituality, philosophy. So I was kind of something in me was really... Uh, I would say eager to, to find something. So I noticed myself going sometimes in, into these workshops of many different traditions, sometimes things really weird. And I was thinking, why, why am I here with this bunch of crazy people? And then I thought, oh, if I'm here, I'm also one of those <laughs> crazy guys. So I was there and I was trying many things and I was seeing value in all of them. So, but Something inside was not feeling, that was something still missing. At some point, I also tapped into this book called uh, Theory U from Otto Sharma, Presencing Institute, and this notion of, of living from the emerging future, that there was two sources of learning, learning, learning from the past, like you read a book and then you can recollect the book and so on, and then the possibility of learning from the future, almost like you tap into a, a deeper source of wisdom and you learn from the future that is emerging. Almost like if you're driving in a road that you don't know, you need to be driving from the emerging future. The future is like literally in your direction. You need to be very aware and, and sense. And so if you're going in a road you know, you might even sometimes forget and you arrive home, you don't even remember the 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 road so i was i was puzzled by this notion of living from the emerging future so at, at some point i was having this uh, uh in my quest of finding something so i decided to 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 go for, to meet a healer and this healer she was a preceptor of of heartphones anna sampo and i was with her and uh, at some point i mentioned my interest in meditation that i was been trying so many things and she she stopped and she looked at me and she said something like, do you really want to meditate? But that, that was a, almost like a, a challenging question. And a part of me said, of course I want. And another part, like a uh, arrogant part, let's call it like that thought, oh, I already know what is meditation, but I, I will give it a try. So I came to her and, the, and she said, okay, we have this, this Sahaj Mark practice and um, she didn't explain too much. So she's just, we just sat and she briefly explained me the practice. And she just, she just said, we, in this practice, this tradition, we meditate on the divine light in the heart, the source of divine light in the heart. Please start meditation. <laughs> and I closed my eyes and I thought, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Should I imagine light? Should I recite light, light, light? What color of light? So I was having all these bunch of thoughts and after a while, she said, that's all. And I, I thought, that's all. But we just started and just <laughs> saying, that's all. But then I looked at my watch and 45 minutes have passed. So that somehow caught my attention. So I came the second day. And again, she explained briefly some things. And again, please start meditation. <laughs> and again, my mind was completely confused because... The mind, my mind was used to instructions. You should do this and you should laborious achieve something, pay attention to the breath, whatever, or other practices. And, and again, my mind was wondering, but this time I noticed that the body was, there was a stillness in the body that was not in sync with the mind. So the mind was all over the place, but the body was in a stillness that for me was new. So there was something that was getting my attention. <laughs> and again, she said, that's all. 
And again, I noticed the watch 45 minutes have, pet, have passed. And again, this was not my experience because with other types of meditation, sometimes five minutes seem like half an hour. And I was just sometimes in my mind thinking, oh, please say, that, please ring the bell or whatever. <laughs> and in this case, it was the opposite. So the third day I came. And this last time, this third th sitting, I just decided I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit, open my heart and wait. And in this day, I just, I just felt I'm home. There was something, it was not a, like a magnificent experience. I didn't have any uh, extraordinary experience, but I had the feeling for the first time that I'm home. <laughs> and this was the 3rd of June of 2009. And from that moment on, I started to be guided from the heart somehow. And the heart started to give me hints of decisions. And I started living from that emerging future that I had read on Otto Sharma book. So it was the first time I felt it was possible to live from the future, that I had some sort of instrument, some sort of compass, the same way as my ancestors, they had this compass to navigate through the seas and find the route to India, whatever. I found that somehow I had a compass. This was not, not conscious. Now I'm making sense of it looking back, but at that moment it was more like a, a felt sense. So. By connecting to the heart, I started to make decisions. And after a few months, I quitted my job. I left my job. I was following this career that I didn't know what it was. Every, everyone thought I was crazy because I was devoting myself to create a tool that was about well-being and, and so on, like a journal, uh, a gratitude journal. And I was gifting this to the world without charging money. So everyone thought that I was somehow crazy, like pursuing... Yeah, uh, yeah, I was, challenges. yeah, I was, so, and then I was here doing this, and then this thing led me to the next thing, which was to create an online program, I was creating online programs, at that time, they were not, quasi kind of the beginning of online programs, training programs, and uh, that led me to then become a trained in, in mindfulness, in a protocol called Mindfulness, Based Emotional Intelligence, a program called Search Inside Yourself that was created at Google. And I had the good fortune to be one of the first 30 teachers in the world to be trained in 2014. And again, it was not a plan that I, oh, now I'm planning to be trained in this. Oh, plan. It was almost like life was bringing me the, the, um, the opportunities. And I was just, I didn't know why I need to go to San Francisco now, especially when, when, when they said I was approved to be part of the program. It was one of the most scariest day because uh, I needed to find $10,000 to pay for the program, another 10,000 for travels and accommodation, and another 10,000 to, to live throughout a year in Portugal uh, while I was not in San Francisco. And, and I only had 2,000 in my bank account, but something inside really said, you need to go there. And, and then life has been calling me to then, okay, now it's time to go and, and, and be trained in presencing. And then it's time to go to India and become a preceptor. So then receiving this invitation to come to India during Charizit Bandara, to become a preceptor. Then now when I thought, oh, now I'm going to be a trainer of, imagine, search inside yourself for many years. Now life tells me, no, now it's time to dive into therapy and you're becoming a therapist. And I kind of, oh, but I don't want to become a therapist. I always run away from becoming a therapist. But in the last, I know, since 2019, that has been my life to become a therapist, learning therapy, working with people one-on-one, -on -one, trauma, and working with people that, I don't know, imagine people that suffered sexual abuse for many years from their parents and how to work with those people. So really tapping into those fields that, that, that I was running away from. And of course, to go there, I need to look at my own stuff also. So, so if you ask me the question, how did I get trained in these things? I don't know. Really, to be very, very honest, I don't know. If you asked me this, this question many years ago, I, that I was going to be here at Kanha delivering a program that is bringing together all these different things, I would say that's crazy because I'm... So as I, I've been trying to surrender to life and to see what is life calling me. And so I don't know what's going to happen next month. Actually, I don't know what's going to happen next week. Wow. Uh, of course, I plan some things and, and people ask me and so on. But some many people after the deep, you said, oh, I want you to come to Spain to deliver this. Or I, I need one to. And I said, maybe. 
if if that is what life wants to live through me, I will. But but I'm not going to make a plan. I don't don't want to create an expectation because I don't know. And sometimes this is very disorienting for me because I need to make a living. I need to have my job, and and uh, and I don't know if I'm going to have to earn money next month. Actually, I didn't earn any. Actually, this month, January, I, I, my my earnings were sixty euros. Okay, January was sixty euros my earning. Okay, and I'm okay with that. Uh, a part of me is afraid, uh, and maybe next month something comes and I will earn. I don't know ten thousand euros by whatever. I, it's it's almost like playful, playing with life, and and, and it's, it's a part of me is scared, but another part is like, okay, let's go into this roller coaster called life. And that's inspiring at the same time. That's so interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. And and I've been having also the good fortune of of having a, a lots of hummingbirds, like you know this little yes. tiny. So I have more than one hundred fifty synchronicities with hummingbirds. So every time I'm in a meaningful situation, like a synchronous situation, a hummingbird shows up, either in person, wow. either someone sends me a message. Either I don't know. Um, I have many stories. Actually, during the pandemic, I wrote 800 pages of just stories. And even in this deep you, on the second day, we were in the in the in the room, and someone came. You need to come outside because some people knew about my stories with with hummingbirds. They were coming from Portugal, and I said, "What is it?" And come, come. So inside the building, there was a, a little tiny hummingbird. And not only he was inside the building, but he has this nest inside the building. What are the chances of that to happen? Yeah, yeah. When I finished the book uh, about Deep You, in the same moment I, I took a picture just to remind, the, like to celebrate the moment, I just took a picture. And at the same moment I have, I even took a picture of, of the, the time, it was 11 something. And a person sent me a message just saying, oh, my, my son just told me that I had a, a shirt with hummingbirds I did, didn't even notice. So here is the message. So I have a lot of stories. Or being in Bangalore, for instance, and receiving a message to meet Daji. He was going for a conference. So we, we were in the middle of the street, me and Anthony, and we received the message. And we it was in one hour. So, so the taxi could not reach Bangalore in one hour. So we entered uh, like a tuk-tuk. Oh, but yeah. the tuk-tuk guy didn't speak English. So we just said, it's around this area. And he said, okay. So we, in the tuk-tuk, like we were what, almost one hour in the traffic, Bangalore. And he said, I know it's around here, but <laughs> you know, Bangalore is too big, right? It's yeah, around here. And the traffic is crazy. And we were in the tuk-tuk. And then we were in these streets. And I saw a, a, a brand that has a, it seemed like a hummingbird. And I said to the, to the tuk-tuk driver, that is the street. And the kind of, the guy was looking at me, how, how does he know? And I said, that is the street. So the guy turned around, he enters the street and it, it was the street. Wow. It was the street. It was wow. right after the, the, that, that, that uh, building, it was the building where Daji was going to give a lecture. Yeah, we have those small birds called sunbirds here, no? So like hummingbirds, yeah. Yeah, so maybe it was a sunbird. I don't know, but it sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to exactly be. It looks exactly like a hummingbird. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't need to be a hummingbird, but at least it, it, yeah. it works. <laughs> but it took you to. Uh, it took, took me. To I Daji. think it actually, in that case, it was a kingfisher. Oh, it, wow. It was, a, it was a, a, a brand that has a kingfisher. Uh, anyhow, but it works. So I have many stories with hummingbirds. Many, That's many, amazing. many, many stories. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So, other people have other types of synchronicities. Absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Say they see butterflies. They have. They look at eleven. Numbers 11. also numbers. numbers. Yeah. A lot of so people have. In the my numbers. case, it's hummingbirds for some reason. So it's almost like road signs, <laughs> uh, because I'm always lost in this life. And then sometimes I'm in this meaningful situation. Then a little hummingbird wow. shows That's up. That's so, so beautiful. That's so beautiful. But a lot of people would be would be petrified of living life like that. That uh, I'm too. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, there's such a lot of uh, there's such a lot of uh, glory put to planning stuff and organizing stuff, and a lot of people value that. Yes, a great deal. So uh, it may not be easy for everybody. How to, how does uh, how does Maria take it? How does your wife take it? Is she okay with? Yeah, she's okay, and she's used to it, and she's uh, and and I have a part of me that is very good in planning and is very good in organizing. And when I'm organizing, for instance, a program like this, there's a lot of work in organization, but it's almost like the the organizing part comes after. 
So it's not about like, I'm, I'm going to put a plan for the future. It's more about waiting for an invitation to come, a direction. And then after the direction, the mind comes and plans and structures. So it's not almost like I'm always lost and where am I going to have dinner? Where do I live? So it's not like that. So, but it's more like, more, most like waiting, waiting for some, something to come. And then when that invitation comes, the, the parts of me that, can structure, that can organize, they are active. The mind, those parts are here, and then I'm very grateful to have that capacity. But, uh, but it's, n it's, it's not planning for the future, it's waiting for the future to say what's, what is it supposed to do, and then I plan uh, afterwards, or I plan as, I, I build the plane as we are moving. Let, let's, let's, let's put, and of course I have the blessing also, Maria, she has a full-time job, but she, she's a very good planner, and in this DPU, she was taking care of all the logistics, uh, she and many other volunteers like Ravi and many others, uh, Arpreet. And again, if I start saying names, I, I will forget a lot of people. But, but there was many people also working and holding that organization part. So, but yeah, it can be very scary. And I have parts that freak out with, with, with sure. if I, when I really think about it, again, if I think that oh, I just earned 60 euros last month. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but yeah, but I trust. There's a, a inner trust that something will emerge in the. F no, yeah. You mentioned uh, learning from the emerging future, right? And you use the analogy of driving down a road that you've never driven down before. Uh, something I experience is that there are roads that we have experienced before, and we drive down them frequently, and we tend to get complacent about it. I mean, I I have a road that I've driven down. I mean, I I could joke that I would tr drive blind blindfolded down this road, but that's where I had an accident, the road accident that I had, because I was. It's I, you don't think about it. You you're like nothing can go wrong on this road. <laughs> so, so is there a case for treating every road as a new road at all times? Oh, that's an aspiration. Uh, at least for me. In in Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, they have this term, the beginner's uh, beginner's mind, yeah. beginner's mind, and I think it, I imagine that's possible. I don't know what is that also because many times I find myself in that road that oh I already know this and uh, and uh, and normally there's when I I do most of my mistakes is 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 there. Yeah. Even sometimes imagine if I'm doing a keynote speech to a company and it's, if it's something that I did many times already. Sometimes I relax a little bit, and those normally don't go so well. Uh, when I'm having this uh, bubbling energy, like, and, and I need to be really present and alert and really be aware, uh, those are the moments where I, I can allow myself to surrender and to let go. But I, I can fully resonate with that because it's very easy when you start, oh, I already know this. Uh, I already know this person. I already yeah, know we this can do job. it with people, with we, family. Yeah, and actually it's yeah. very easy. We start judging people. Yeah. Actually, there's an exercise one, one teacher once told me, which was uh, try to reach home and speak with your wife and try to see something that you never notice in your wife. And uh, and it's a nice exercise because you might notice, oh, she has a sign here. I never noticed that sign. Of course, you don't tell, tell <laughs> Or, you, or she has a little gray hair here, or she has a whatever. So to try to see life as children can can see as something fresh and new, it's something that we can train and we can remind ourselves. But it's not easy because also it saves, uh, our, our brain is also, uh, um, tries to save energy. So it's sometimes it's helpful and useful to be able to be doing two things at the same time and be driving and having a conversation with someone. And, and it's also a nice thing, nice capability. But, um, but I, the more we are able to be aware of ourselves, the body, the mind, the surroundings, um, the more we are also able to pick what is life wanting to live through us. Because if I'm not aware, I cannot see the signs that life is always uh, telling us, right? Sending like in this direction, go here. Or the heart telling like, this is not a good decision because you're too much maybe in the mind and the heart is yelling like, no, 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 no. But you say, oh no, this is really okay. So even with companies, for instance, sometimes I work mostly in the corporate uh, world now still giving uh, training programs and so on. Not, not a DPU program, it's like mm, different programs. But um when when there's an invitation from a company, I always try to use the heart to sense 
the intention of the of the of the client because many clients don't have a good intention they might be wanting to bring a imagine a well-being program just wash their hands and say okay they are burning out but we offer them a well-being program it's not our fault we are doing our or, or, or we are just doing this to show in the whatever report uh, so I always try to sense, and actually there was a once, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not of course saying the name of the company, but it's a very well-known company. And the guy told me, oh, we want to do, I think it was a mindfulness program. And I asked, why, why mindfulness and why do you want to bring this to the company? And the guy said, well, because people are burning out and we still want to increase the speed and we don't want them to burn out. And I was a part of me was shocked, like, like the, the the cold way he was saying that. And, and it, another part was grateful that he was being open with nice. me, honest. And I was also honest and saying, maybe I'm not the right person for you to work with. I respect your intention, but I, I will not be comfortable with my heart if I accept the, and it was a big money project. But um, so the heart allows to also, as we know, to to sense, is there a, should I take this or not? Should I? And even if the mind is in autopilot mode, it's, if we have this training, which I believe heartfulness, at least for me, has been giving me this sensitivity to hmm, to intuit, to sense, uh, it makes it easier, easier to make decisions. Even if sometimes the mind is completely not knowing, not understanding, not, why are you making this decision? Uh, but, but if the heart is at peace, uh, the mind is at rest, right? As, as, uh, <laughs> Well, it's a difficult decision uh, to make, of course, because even with the tools that heartfulness offers you, those could also, there's, there's this mindset of, oh, everybody is uh, your, your brother and sister. So how can you judge them, you know? So it's like, it's like you, your heart is saying no, but then, but then there's a voice saying, but no, but it'll help in the end. <laughs> I, the, the intention is not right, but you know, it's like uh, it will help them only. It can't, nothing can go wrong. So it's difficult to discern. So you really have to tune in. It's like finding that, you know, those old radios, the finding that station was so difficult. You just turn the dial a little bit more and you would lose it. And uh, so listening to the heart is not that simple. Actually. It's not that simple. That's why it requires practice. That's why we do the cleaning. That's why we meditate every day. <laughs> That's why we make mistakes. That's why we pray for forgiveness of those mistakes. So, because it's a continuous journey. And uh, the moment we think, oh, now, now, now I'm there. <laughs> Go back to the first, <laughs> Go back. Yeah, invitation for disaster. So it's, it, it requires this fine tuning. And even the part of you that you were mentioning, oh, this person, he, I want to help. It's good to check with the part. Why, 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 where is this part coming from? Is it coming from a place that I want to be seen as a good person? And if I'm, I'm afraid of saying, if I say no, I'm going to be a bad, a bad uh, abiyazi or where, where is this coming from? Because sometimes actually there's a very interesting study from, from I think it's Columbia University it's from Adam Grant, uh, and maybe I'm forgive me if I'm not. Uh, replying, uh, not, not, how to say, sorry, sometimes my English, uh, acknowledging correctly. So, but he, he, he tried to see who are the most uh, successful people. Uh, are the altruists, the one that start the relationship saying, how can I help you? Are the takers, like the one that I just want to take from you and, and whatever I can take? Or are the matchers, like the one that I give you something if you give me something? So he, he was curious. So he study at least uh, three in this particular uh, book called Give and Take, uh, three different um, types of people, engineers, medical students, and the other I don't remember. And he, he was curious. So. The question is, who are the most successful people? And I, I can ask you that question. Are the, the, do you think are the, the altruists, are the, the takers, or are the matchers? I want to say altruists, but I'm sure it's the wrong answer. It's the right answer. And yes, yes. and the question is, what, who are the kind of the, the least successful? The, the, the matchers? The altruists. Really? <laughs> yes. So the the matchers yeah. and the takers, at least yeah. in this study, they are in the kind of in the middle. So the majority of people are are there. Sure. Okay. But the, the the interesting thing was that the altruists were the most successful and the least successful. Wow. And the difference was that 
these ones, as far as my understanding of the of the study comes, so again, so I apologize if I'm not making uh, the thing correctly, is that these ones, the most successful, they they started the relationship from a place of how can I help you? But if they sense that the other was taking advantage, they they were able to put boundaries and say no. While these other ones, they could not say no. They were either afraid that the others will not love them, yeah. or they were either afraid that the, the others will hurt them, or they are afraid that they will not be seen as good people or good colleagues or good abiyazis, whatever. But these ones, they could they could ask questions like, "Why do you need this? So why, how can I be helpful?" They say could say things though. I'm sorry, that's not my responsibility. I cannot help you. So so these ones would would normally be. Uh, I don't know, uh, the takers would take advantage sure. while these ones are able to say no. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the, again, if you come back to trauma, many times the ones that cannot say no, it comes from a place of trauma. It comes of a place of, so there is no self-respect. Yeah. So, and yeah. self respect yeah, and self-compassion. And this doesn't mean that I'm I'm kind of egoistical and I'm just taking care of my own needs. No, if 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 I can't, if I don't, if I don't have the capacity to help you now, it's better maybe to say no. Or if I sense that you are kind of taking advantage of me, it's actually very helpful and useful and, and a, a response of sanity to say, I'm sorry, this is not correct that you are taking advantage of me. So, so that's why I think it's so important for us to, yes, have this, this come from this place of being of service, but also as a place of self-respect and, and not allowing people that they might have their own issues, their own traumas, and maybe that's the way they survived. But to be able to say, no, I'm sorry, I understand that you have that need, but I'm, I cannot help you at this so moment. It's a, it's a well-intentioned no. It's a well-intentioned no, because the no, uh, in this case, is to, to set the boundary. And the more clear are your boundaries, the more you can relate with others, mm -hmm. the more you can Others also respect you and you can respect others as well because it's clear what, where, where is the boundary. And all animals, they, they, anger, for instance, is a healthy response to put boundaries. And the healthy anger is not aggression. It's very different. Healthy anger is a response of saying, no, you are invading my boundary and that's not correct. Please step back. And it's not aggressive. It's, it actually comes from a very peaceful, dignified space of saying no. And many of us, because again, our stories, the traumas, we are afraid of saying no, because many times that was a way to survive. Because if I would say no, maybe my parents would kick me or the, the my colleagues, whatever. So I learned to be very nice. And I know this very well. I have a people pleaser part in me that is very smiley, very nice. And, so, and sometimes people, when I say kind of a no, like which is more like really no, they kind of become surprised because they are not expecting that from this smiley part in me like to be really kind of no and i can so i need to balance also this other part not to become into like an aggressive no it's more like a respectful no and this is something i've been working for instance in therapy uh, because i learned to survive in my context to be very smiley always nice i don't want to create any disruption in my context so i needed to suppress my authenticity uh, and be, yeah. to be able to stay in relationship, to stay attached, to stay connected. And many of us, we, we had the same response or similar. So, so yeah, come, it's come back to this self-respect and a respectful yeah. no. The thing is, uh, I think often it's the, it's the way the no is communicated also matters a lot. Because it can be communicated in an aggressive way, it can be communicated, to, but if your heart is in it, if your heart is the intention of helping the other person is still there when you are saying no, that I suppose is something that we could all learn. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And even say, oh, I'm sorry, no, I cannot, or I'm not the right person, but you try this. I can, I can offer some possibilities. Um, and that's one of the programs I think that... Uh, uh, Liz Kings North does called heartful communication. That's yeah, heartful, heartful communication. Yeah. yeah, because a lot of the misunderstandings that happen are because of communication, not because of intentions. Because as you mentioned, most people, there's an essential goodness in most people. Yeah, yeah, and common needs, as Liz also speaks, common needs. So, so for instance, the person that wants a lot of structure, like make everything like a plan, and the person that doesn't want any structure, both of them are trying to protect the need of. I'm I'm competent. 
So, and the one tries to be competent by making sure they control everything. And the other tries to be competent by making sure that if something go, goes wrong, I cannot be blamed by it. <laughs> it's like the student that doesn't study and say, oh, I didn't study. But the need is the same. Is the need to, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm capable, I'm competent. So, yeah. So Vasco, being um, a facilitator, being a keynote speaker and being a person who does workshops, a lot of people must be coming to you for advice. A lot of people must be. How easy or difficult is it to just go ahead and offer them advice or allow it to come from themselves? Because it's like, it's very easy to just, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. But uh, I know for a fact that that's not how you operate. That's why you call yourself a facilitator, not a advisor. So how do you approach that? Yeah, the, the hell is full of good advices, right? As they say. <laughs> So one of the things I, I've been learning from these uh, trauma approaches um, and also from our tradition and so on is that uh, the belief that the, the answer lies within, okay? So the more I can facilitate the person to connect with, with, with themselves within, the more they will find the answer. So uh, because if I'm giving an advice, I'm just projecting into them something. Of course, sometimes there's there's some advice. If the person really asks for an advice, imagine, should I meditate in the morning? Should I meditate in the afternoon? I can give some structure like say, oh, this is the suggestion, try it out, be the scientist and then decide for yourself. So I can give some advice, but very rarely I try to give like an advice like, oh, you should go for this job or you don't, don't do this. Actually, that is a form of aggression because I'm not an enlightened being to be giving advice to people. I'm just a regular human being. So, so, but what I can do is that I, I can, I can hold a space for you to connect within and from that place of connection for you to find the answer. And that I've been trained to do and that I, and I'm always amazed by the answers that people find within. And I noticed that if I'm in, imagine a therapy session one on one and I, and I, have the this advice giving part in <laughs> like trying to give advice and if this part comes out and gives advice i normally sense that the other person um, closes close a little bit close a little bit so i need always to have this part in check like just step back like like um and if the person asks for advice i might give some advice but it needs to come from the person um even in the in the program the the, the dpu program one of the things we we try to set the field for the participants is never give advice, never try to save the other. Sometimes I, I remember there was one exercise that we were guiding, which was more from the trauma field. And there were several people were crying, really sobbing during the exercise because they touched some pain inside. And I, I the way I set the field before was, if you notice that someone is like crying and so on, just be present. You don't need to do anything else. Just be present, be a safe regulating presence for that person. Maybe you can offer a tissue if the person wants, but please, 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 please don't try to save the other. Because the moment you try to save the other, you are putting the other into a victim. And you are saying that you know the answer and the other doesn't know the answer, okay? So it's very important just to hold space and to be willing to be with another person that is suffering. And it's painful also to be in that space because there's parts that want to, oh, don't cry, oh, don't forget about it. It's, it comes from also from a good intention. We, yeah. we want to help, we want yeah. to give advice to help the other. Oh, I've been there, you just just do that. It comes from a good intention, of course, but, uh, but it can harm the other without us wanting to harm the other. Actually, we want the opposite. So, but the more we are able to hold space, be with the person, Really like a grandmother when the, when the, imagine when we fall when we were kids and the grandmother just held us and, and just, they, they just gave us a lot of love and they were there and, and that's, that's enough. That's enough. And if we need something, we say, hey, mama, can we have a, can I have a ice cream or whatever? <laughs> or what should I do? And, and, and that comes from inside. So it's tricky because people, we are trained to give advice yeah. and to jump into. Yeah, and also people kind of panic you know, when they see someone. Because that it's touching their own pain. Exactly, so they're, they're panicking, they don't have the patience to see this through. They say, I need to stop this now. Uh, if someone's breaking down, someone's crying, I need to intervene. I need to, I need to save them. Uh, yeah, so it's, it requires a great deal of patience to just say, okay. Yeah, that's, that's why the work of a facilitator is sometimes not um, 
easy. So sometimes people ask me, oh, how can I facilitate this program? And and it's 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 the, the most challenging, it's not the, the theories or the, the, the content, it's more about working with yourself. And, and I remember again, Arawan Ayashi, one of my teachers, she say, if you want to be a, a teacher of this type of work, in that case, social presence in theater, you need to be able to be comfortable in situations where you're going to be very uncomfortable, where a group of people, it's a, there's a lot of tension in the room and you need to be holding that tension. You need to be the, um, almost like the... Sponge soaking it in. Yeah, you need to be the sponge. And then after that, you need to have practices to dissolve the, those, some scars, those burdens. I don't know if those are some scars, but I imagine so. So, so it's ve very much of the work is, is with you to be a sponge, to be a vessel, to clean the vessel, to, so, and um, it's not about the content. The content is the easy part. It takes work, but it, 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 that's the easy part. The, 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 the other part, the emotional field, the whole the field, that's the part that is more tricky. It's, and it's not, there is not a, a plan how to do, how to deal, how to work with. It's very much about your own intuition in, in your own. Dun, dun, ta -ra 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 -dun, dun, <laughs> Yeah. So, and and the heartfulness practice helps you hold that. Ah, I have no doubt about it. Without the heartfulness practice, I would not. I was probably being smoking now probably three packs a day or four. Maybe I already had a a heart attack by this time. Um, I was not eh, for sure. I was not being here speaking with you. Yeah. So, if I'm here and if I got to know all these different practices, I have not a slight doubt that as I've been guided through the heart to be here now so I, I so yeah and I'm very grateful to for that so into our teachers our guides our, the practice the community yeah and this guidance uh, it seems to have started early for you. you you mentioned the book Celestine Prophecy I think that yeah in 1997 yeah you read that in 1997 but just the fact that you picked up this book to read there must have been something in your childhood that pushed you in this direction that was a curiosity to understand. Uh, was was it there? Do you, do you trace that back to something in your childhood? Yeah, the, thank you for that question because I, um, I was very much a quiet child during most of my, as I was growing up and I was very curious. I was all experimenting stuff and trying many different things. And I remember it when I was a, maybe six year old, I had this uh, experience that I was almost rotating like a dervish. I never saw a dervish, but I was somehow rotating for some reason. I was alone, I was home alone. And I start suddenly hearing voices, like uh, like a murmuration of voices. I don't know if that's the term, murmuration is with birds, right? But like, like a almost like there was a, a, crowd of, a crowd of people speaking in a language that I could not understand but they were surrounding me. It was like a, I would say, 30 second experience. But it was, it was very touching. I don't know what they were saying. I don't know if it was just a hallucination of my mind till this day, but it was some sort of a, a spiritual um, experience that I still remember today. And to hear these voices very, almost like they were praying. They were doing some sort of a ritual and I was inside that room. And then it dissolved. So I don't know, maybe that, that planted the seed inside. And also I had another situation when I was in my uh, sex, drugs and rock and roll kind of lifestyle without as much sex as I wanted as a, <laughs> as a teenager. Uh, uh, I had an experience with psychedelics, with mushrooms, which also opened me into some sort of dimension that I was not uh, expecting. And uh, I was kind of connecting with with something. So I, I sense that also opened some longing to to the possibility that, that the reality is much more than what our eyes and our ears and, and our senses can can perceive. So, but I, but then it vanished, but, but I, I felt that this, there was always this longing inside for something to be filled somehow, like uh, to be at home, to, to find home, to come back home. And, and again, when there was that, that those sittings, uh, again, 3rd of June, 2009, from that day on, I, I, I barely missed one day of practice. 
And even if I had, I was trained then in other practices, but um, but I never saw those other practices as spiritual practices for me. My spiritual heart is 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 here. And even sometimes when I come here at Kana, people say, "Oh, Vasco is a mindfulness teacher." And yes, yeah, sometimes I'm in that role as a mindfulness teacher. Sometimes I'm in the role of a presence, social presencing theater teacher. Sometimes I'm in the role of the therapist. But uh, but my spiritual home is 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 in the heart, and heartfulness gives me that possibility. And I cannot express the, I don't know, some the blessings I've been receiving through the heart. They are there, yeah, yeah. It's beyond words. It's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's interesting how many people um, psychedelics plays like a role of a doorway to uh, to open up the quest of spirituality and. Uh, it's it's uh, it's really really interesting that how it can actually uh, you know be useful in that way, but it can be very harmful if pursued. Yeah, and I and I didn't yeah. feel actually I was scared after the experience. I, f I felt that this is not my path. It opened the door, um, and at that time again I was uh, trying different uh, you know alcohol, and so maybe maybe not for sure to numb my anxiety, to numb my anger, to numb my pain. So I was just trying to find ways to numb the pain I was I was carrying and try to find escape routes from the pain. Um, but I got scared with psychedelics, even if it was just one experience. I, I noticed that I. I can easily go into that side and not come back. And uh, and that's not what, I, what I'm looking for. My heart is not longing for that. My heart wants, longs for some deep connection with, uh, with truth. Yeah, I would, I would often tell my friends that I would be happily drunk the rest of my life if I didn't have to be sober for even one second. Then it was fine. <laughs> then I could do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that one second of sobriety would, would be... Hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can relate. I can relate. Yeah. So, Vasco, a lot of people are very anxious now, generally, about the state of the world, about where humanity is going. There's, there's, there's a sense of you know, and special. I think it's more in the West than uh, than in the East. What, what, what I uh, see on popular media and in uh, culture and things like that. You travel all over the world. What do you? What do you? feel about what, what where is the world headed uh do you do you look at the future with optimism hmm. <laughs> it depends on the the distant future or if it's a near future i sense that in the near future we're going to go through some challenging moments in the west as we are already going through in many countries and maybe some disruption will emerge in the society maybe violence maybe Almost what what I almost like the metaphor that comes is like a wave, and the wave is becoming bigger, but the wave also like the lower there's a lower part which is the disruption, which is the disconnection, which is the violence, which is so many of these things, but it also has the potential of something new, and what I've been seeing and connecting is that almost these two things are present at the same time. I see a lot of people completely dissociated from reality, again, numbing themselves through work, alcohol, drugs, pornography, so many ways to escape reality. Sometimes even using meditation as a way to escape instead of a, something to connect. So we can use whatever we have at hand to dissociate. But at the same time, I'm seeing proportionally a lot of projects, a lot of people coming together, a lot of people finding solutions to deal with the ecological challenges, with the social challenges, with spiritual challenges. And again, using, for instance, meditation with a purpose to connect within and to really manifest who they are in the world. So I see both at the same time. And I'm curious to see the clash because uh, I sense that this, as Otto Sharma says, and this is a term he uses, there's a new world dying. And we see that disruption in many places, especially the West, this old world is collapsing. Institutions are collapsing. People are losing the trust in institutions, um, fake news, so many th different things like the rise of far right and these movements that are um, somehow disrupting a lot of uh, things and, and f maybe far left as well. So I'm not taking sides. I just see this far, these extremes, these polarizations. But at the same time, 
there's a, for instance, in Portugal, I see a lot of communities trying new things, trying this. So, and this is not visible. So what is visible through media is the disruption, the, the corruption, the, the wars, the, and so on. But negativity speaks louder than positivity always. <laughs> it sells more. It sells more. It's good for the business, while the good things are not good for the business. But just look at the examples like Hanha. And actually in the DPU program, that was also one of the intentions we had was to show how Kanha and the heartfulness is bringing solutions to deal with the ecological divide and challenges in the ecological side, to deal with the social divide and how people can co-live co co together and, and relate with each other from a place of respect, independently of the religion background, of this age, of whatever. And also the spiritual divide, because this is the most challenging divide I, I sense we've been having, which is this disconnection from who we really are. Who, who am I? And so the amount of suicides in the West, I don't know in India, but in the West and in the world, actually, before the pandemic, according to, I think it was Oxfam, um, it was not Oxfam, I think it was the, anyhow, I don't remember the source, I'm not going to say sources that I'm not sure, but uh, there, there was a source that suggested a study that, uh, that there were more people dying from suicides than wars, natural disasters and homicides together. So if you bring together these three things, there were still more people dying from suicides. And I believe that with the COVID pandemic and the social isolation and so on, these number raised even more. So, but this is, this is me just guessing now because I don't have data to support what I'm saying now, but at least even in Portugal, the, the, the rate of people suiciding, the famous people, people that everyone knows someone that suicided in the last, I don't know, two, three years. So, so yeah, there's going to be challenges and I think we are going all to be called to, I think we chose to be here for that also, right? <laughs> for some reason or another. Uh, but also there's the possibility of from the disruption for us to, so the old, old world is dying, but there, this new world emerging that also Otto speaks about. So, and I think Kanha is an example of the new world that is emerging. And there are many other projects. So not only Hartman says, we know, so many other people coming together. Yeah, and I think one of the things that inspires me in Daji um, is, is, is vision also of unity, of, of bringing together the, everyone that is contributing to a greater good to bring together to to join together join hands and let's let's co-create this new world together knowing that at the same time there's going to be suffering pain disruption and the more we can hold each other the more we can create a, a generative social field that can um, be uh, there's a study for, i think it's from physics or from biology, I don't know, when there's a lot of chaos, I think it's biology, a lot of chaos uh, in, in cultures of, of bacteria, I think, if there's some of them that are creating a field of coherence, the whole field shifts. So if there's little pockets of sanity, the whole social field changes. So I'm not, I'm not putting this as, as elegantly as, the, as I read it, but, uh, but that pos potential of, imagine different groups of people coming together with the same purpose they can affect this, the bigger social field and and maybe allow humanity to do a little shift doesn't need to be a dramatic shift but a little shift that makes us go in a more um, healthy joyful loving caring compassionate well thank you so much vasco it's been so wonderful talking to you and it's been really nice thank you Ruthie. and i hope you come back to ghana soon I hope too. I hope too. <laughs> I hope the world allows traveling in the next near future. Yes, yes. And it's, it's, thank you so much for taking time out. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank okay. you. And thank you for your work. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I don't do anything. I, it's, it's, uh, it's just come, people like you who come together and... Uh, mm. All, we are all co-creating this future. Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's just the people coming together that happens. Thank you so much, Vasco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of KanaCast. Please follow and subscribe to KanaCast on Spotify, YouTube and Instagram. Until next time. Woof, woof. <laughs>